God will tell you, yes, pursue it, overtake it, and recover it all. There are certain issues and problems that take specific answers. And for you in your own life, with your own gifting, with the tools that God given you, you are a specific answer to someone's prayer. And sometimes Jesus will keep us in a situation until we know who he is. Hey, if you have your Bibles, iPhones, iPads, Pomona, I want you to bring them out and listen to me today. There's a scripture here in Proverbs 18 and verse number 14 that I want to share with you. From this verse, I'm going to extrapolate a thought that I'd like to minister to you today. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, 14, the strong spirit of a man or woman will sustain him in bodily pain or trouble, but a weak and broken spirit who can raise him up or bear him. Notice I want to change it up a little bit. Somebody who has a strong spirit will be sustained in trouble. Somebody who has a weak spirit will not be able to bear the trouble that's in their lives. Today I want to talk about what does it mean to be strong in spirit. There's a lot of people that are strong in power, fame, fortune, influence, prestige, status. There's a lot of people that are strong there. There's a lot of people that possess strength when it comes to financial strength. They have a good, uh, uh, the assets, they have a good financial backing, uh, they make good money, they're strong in the financial world. There's some people that are strong in the intellectual world. They are highly intelligent, highly educated, have brilliant IQs, and are very skilled. Then you have people that are very strong physically. Their physical bodies are very strong by their endurance, by how much they can lift, uh, by their heart rate, by their pulse. So we have all kinds of strengths that exist. But if I told you what does it mean to be strong in spirit, many people don't even know what it is. They don't even know that they are a spirit being. What is spirit? I know what my physical man is. I know what my intellectual man is. I know what my financial man looks like or my world. What is my spirit man? And yet you've got to understand that you are made in the image and likeness of God. God, Pomona, is a, is a triune being. He's called the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and the God the Holy Spirit. He is all God, but he manifests himself as God the Son and the Holy Spirit. As the Father, as the Son, and as the Holy Spirit. All distinct unto themselves and their character and their personality, yet one God. Now don't let that be confusing because that's who you are. You have a body. What is the name of your body? Your name, Diego. I have a soul, my mind, my will, and my intellect. What is that called? Diego. I have a spirit. What is that called? Diego. They're all Diego, yet they all three possess different attributes. God says, I pray your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved. So he's talking about all three of who you are. And many people have tapped definitely into their physical realm. They know what that looks like. They know how to measure strength and weakness there. People know how to tap their mental realms or their emotional realms. They could tap the strength and weakness there. But no people know how to measure or are ignorant about their spirit spiritual man. And if you're going to grow as a Christian, you need to understand who the spirit in you is and how you develop them. And you can't afford to neglect that. So how, if I was to ask you a question, how do we measure natural strength? So I'm going to measure natural strength. Okay, I want to see how many push-ups you can do. I want to see how many stairs, uh, flights of stairs you can carry. Go up. Okay, I want you to bench press. I want you to curl. I think all those squeeze something. Those are all tests to evaluate something, right? Yes, we agree. Nobody wants to talk to me. Let's move. Pomona, Pomona, do you agree? Pomona. Okay, if we had a mental, we had an intellectual test, then we're going to take an IQ test, and that's going to tell us something. We're going to take some form of adaptability test with reasoning and rationale. That's going to tell me how emotionally stable you are, right? Okay. I want to look at how strong you are financially. What do I look at? I look at your credit rating. Don't rebuke me. Don't get mad at me. I'm going to look at your credit rating. And your credit rating is going to tell me something. How am I going to measure your spiritual man? So for the rest of my time, I'm going to talk about how we measure how strong or how weak we are in our spirit man. 
Luke 1 and verse number 80 says this. So the child grew, speaking of John the Baptist, the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the desert till the day his manifestation to Israel. Notice this key word. John the Baptist was not born strong in spirit. Just because you're a Christian does not mean you're strong in spirit. Just because you come to church doesn't mean you're strong in spirit. It's not automatic. It's not osmosis. You have to become. That's something you, God gives you all the potential, but it's up to you to develop your spiritual being. You could be the same way all your Christian life and never grown. You know, there's one bone in your entire body that you were born with that has not grown since you were a baby, since the day you were born. It's in your ear. It's the tiniest bone. It's never grown at all. And what do you call something that's not grown in the natural? It's deformed. It's deformed if it doesn't grow. We don't want to be individuals that are deformed, not reaching our potential or dwarfs in our faith or in our spirit. We want to become. Become is a process. So it's falling on your face. It's learning. It's getting up. It's repenting. It's saying, I'm not going to do it again. Don't get discouraged when you mess up. We all mess up. God's not over you with a bat ready to slap you. As long as you are falling forward, do you know the difference between falling forward and falling backwards? Backwards, people never get back up from their mistake. Falling forward says, I want to learn and I want to do better and I want to grow through my mistakes. And before you came to Christ, you fell backwards. You didn't care about what you did. Now in Christ, you care. So if you fall and mess up, just fall forward and learn something from it. But I want you to recognize you grow in strength. You become. It's a practice. It's a process. It's over and it's it's over and it's over. Why is strong in spirit so important? Because we lived in a world full of hurt, hurt, hopelessness, helplessness, pain, rejection, betrayal, discourage. I could go on. Despondency, discontentment. You and I live in a world like that, and you cannot afford to have a weak spirit. Let me talk to you today. I don't know that this world is going to get any better. It can't get better for the Antichrist to rise up. There has to be absolute. If you know your Bible, here's what you need to know. The world is going to fall apart, which is going to open the door for the Antichrist, who is going to be full of, of, of ideas and solutions and strategies to help us in all areas of our failures. That's why he's going to be able to recruit a lot of people. Anybody hear what I'm talking? So it doesn't get better. It's got to get worse to lead into that. So troubles and adversities and trials are going to come to all of us, Christian, non-Christian, in church, out of church. But the difference is, are you strong in spirit? Because those in strong in spirit will thrive through it. Those strong in spirit will overcome through it. Those strong, strong in spirit are going to be able to avoid some of the things that are coming down the pike. So it is essential that you be strong in spirit. It's essential that you become strong in spirit. So watch, watch this. Let me give you an example. 2 Timothy 3, 5. They will appear to have a godly life, but they will not let its power change them. Stay away from such people. Now he's talking about false teachers and false prophets, but I also want to learn from it. I don't want to have a, a, appear to have a godly life, but I have no power. Because then that, all that is is a universal studio front. All that is a universal studio house. How many of you know it's beautiful, it's painted, but it's got no backing? So how many of you know it's going to look good as long as the sun is shining? But when there's a storm coming its way and heavy winds, it's going to wipe that away. And that's the way some Christians are. They look really good on Sunday morning. And they look really good when everything's going their way. But when the storms of life begin to blow, they recognize I have the form of godliness, but I don't have the power. He goes on, he says in another, another translation, they will go to church, yes, but they won't really believe anything they hear. Don't be taken by these people. So there's like the three pigs. They're building their house on the wood and the straw. And when the big bad wolf, the devil comes to huff and puff and blow your house down, there it falls. Instead of building it on the foundation of God and his word and faith, 
we begin to see that. How many of you know there's a difference between being in shape and being healthy? See, just because you look in shape. See, I can have Botox that makes me look like I'm in shape. I could have plastic surgery that legs me. I could have suck this, suck that, turn this, blow up this, and I'll look like I'm in shape. But you don't know what's going on on the inside of me. I could be very, very unhealthy. And in the church, we think, people, it's good enough to be in shape. But again, it's when you climb the flight of stairs, we're going to find out if shape is good enough. It's going to go when you get laid off. It's going to go when your marriage isn't going well. It's going to be seen when your children go wayward, if you're really healthy or you're just in shape. So let me give you an example now. Let me give you an example. What does it look like when someone is weak in spirit? Well, like Demas, it happens because you love this world more than you love God. And because of that, there'll be a forsaking and a departing within you. What are the signs of a weak spirit? When you love something more than you love God, you will always be weak in spirit. I love my children. I love my wife. I love my job. I love my career. I love my Facebook followers. I love my body. I love my money. Okay, then you are setting yourself up to always be weak in spirit because Demas could not sustain his relationship with Jesus Christ. It was not sustainable because he loved the world more than he loved God. And eventually, he forsook God and he departed from God. Always be a weak spirit when you love the world more than you love God. But like the disciples who are inconsistent in their walk, they followed Jesus as long as Jesus fed them and he did good teachings. The moment as Jesus said anything that was confronting or anything challenging to them, at that point, the Bible says they went away and they walked with him no more. So a sign of being weak in spirit is there's an inconsistency in your life. It's not that you don't start, it's that you don't finish nothing. It's not that you don't do it, you don't stay doing it. So you always be weak in spirit when you carry on the, the, the signs of an inconsistent life. You're a good husband, but you're inconsistent. You're a good wife, but you're inconsistent. You're a good father, but you're inconsistent. You're in church, but you're inconsistent. You're in the Bible and the Word inconsistently. You do not have a strong spirit. You are weak in spirit because there's inconsistencies in your life. Like the ten spies and like Israel, you are faint-hearted and fearful and feeble. The moment opposition comes your way, the moment delays come your way, the moment difficulties come your way, you walk away as a victim. You walk away complaining. You walk away having a pity party. You say, woe is me. See, the moment they went into the promised land, they met up with giants And these 10 spies says, we are like grasshoppers. You should have left us in Egypt. We're going to die. Woe is us. So I want you to recognize when you have a fearful attitude, fearful attitude, and you're feeble and you're fair weathered, it's a sign of a weak spirit. Because again, anybody could be strong in perfect conditions. But when things go south in your life and things don't go the way you expected them to go, See, how many of you know everybody, most, mostly everyone, mostly everybody has a wonderful honeymoon. Everybody loves each other on their honeymoon. How many of you agree? 99.9% of people are in love with each other. But how many of you know the honeymoon ends? Now, now I know you're going to play, well, the honeymoon doesn't have to end. Well, I'm talking about the time. The time you went away, it ends. Because now someone's got to go to work. And we can't live in the bedroom all day long because we got to eat. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And so at that point, you begin to see how strong the relationship is. The Bible says they too shall become one. Become one is a process just like we're talking about today. Of being strong in spirit is a process. So fearfulness. When opposition and difficulty and walking around with negativism and blaming others is a sign that you are weak. It's not my fault. If that girl didn't come on to me, it wouldn't be my, and my wife treated me bad. You're weak in spirit. I want you to recognize, like Saul and his army and the children of Ephraim, when the unexpected happens or things don't go as they plan and you experience failures and battles, then it often reveals the weakness within us. 
And, and like Samson, we can't say no to temptations and false attractions and compromise and sin. Samson possessed unbelievable power. He had, a Naz- he had a Nazarite vow. But watch what the Bible says. Now Samson went down to Timnah and he saw a woman of Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. So he went up, told his father and mother saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me as a wife. I ain't praying about nothing. Don't need to seek God. Don't need to be equal, unequal. She is fine. And I could care less about their past. I could care less about their exes. I could care less about how many children they have. I could care less whether they have a job or not. They are fine. And I want some of that. He's weak in spirit because he can't say no to temptation, compromise, or sin. Watch this. It repeats. It'd be one thing if you only did it once. Now Samson went to Gaza. This time he's going after a whore, a harlot, and a prostitute. And he saw her and he went to her, went and had sex with her. This is a man of God. This is someone with great attributes of ability, but doesn't know how to resist. He's weak in spirit when you can't say no to temptation. Temptation is going to come all, uh, uh, to all of us, but you have to have the ability through a strong in spirit to be able to resist it, to walk away. It's a fight sometimes. It's real, or else it wouldn't be a temptation. There'd be a gravitational pull. Come on, does anybody know what I'm talking about? You can leave me by myself here. But when you're strong in spirit, things rise up in you, like conviction and consciousness. And what if I get caught? And how long is this going to last? And what if, what if, where's my marriage going to go? And how am I going to tell my children? Am I going to lose my job? I can't, what is God going to think? See, all that begins to rise up, and it kills your joy really quick. Weak in spirit. What, what does that look like? Well, like the children of Israel, it's an dis- indecisiveness. Joshua told the children of Israel, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. I don't know. I don't know. And how many of you ever met somebody that just can't make a decision? You going to church today? I don't know. You going to join the church today? I don't know. You can get involved in that anniversary uh, thing? I don't know. They're, just, they're in and they're out. They're indecisive. Have you ever seen one of these people in front of you at McDonald's? How many times have you been to McDonald's? What are you looking at the menu for? Or let alone in and out with a smaller menu. Hmm. Because they got an in and out in Pomona. They got them all over. But See, when you can't make a decision, indecisiveness, in, out, forward, against it, want to be married, want to be single, then you have a weak spirit. And last of all, it, it's, it's not in your notes, Lot. Lot hangs around wrong people in wrong places. You will always be weak in spirit. When he's around Uncle Abraham, he lives right. But when he's separated from Uncle Abraham, He hangs out with Sodomites and Gomorites. I don't even know if Gomorites is a word, but I'm making it up. (laughs) Why? Because he's hanging around wrong people, which are making him weak in spirit, not strong in spirit. And he's hanging around wrong places, which are making him weak in spirit and not in strong in spirit. So I want to ask you a question today. How do you feel when you haven't eaten in a long time? You feel weak. How do you feel when you're sick? You feel weak. How do you feel when you're tired? You feel weak. And and when you're weak in spirit, you can easily be knocked over, pushed over, tripped up, overcome. There's a retreatness to you. You regress to the old man, to the old ways, to the old lifestyle, and the old way of thinking. But I want to share with you a great example found in the Word of God about Jesus and, and how he grew And it's taken from Luke 2 and verse 40. And the child grew, speaking of Jesus, and became strong in spirit. I love this. Filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. Stay with me now. I'm going to park it. One of the greatest signs that you are strong in spirit is that you possess the wisdom of God in your life. And you possess the grace of God in your life. 
Now, this isn't just because you're a Christian this happens. The potential is there. Watch this. Wisdom has nothing to do with education. Wisdom has nothing to do with smarts. Wisdom is God's wisdom to discern between right and wrong, what is good and what is bad, what is the will of God and what isn't the will of God. And it's amazing how many people come to you or come to us and say, I need you to pray for the will of God for me. Now, I know there's always a portion that gets a little gray and maybe you're choosing between two job offers so you want the wisdom of God. But I'm telling you, when you begin to operate as a strong spirit, automatically you're going to have the wisdom of God to be able to make right choices and right decisions. So how does a person marry right? How does a person uh, raise godly kids? How does a person stay on their job? How does a person have successful finances? Why does this do it? Because it's an attribute of wisdom. They made great godly choices in their lives. And those that aren't may have not, and there's always an exception to that, that someone did something stupid and they had to inherit it, even though they're, they're a good person. But you and I, today in today's world, I need godly wisdom. Listen to me, young people, corporate America people, marketplace leaders. Listen, it's a competitive world out there. And if you're going to try to match skill with skill, it's too competitive. You're going to try to match competency with competency, it's too good. You want to match diploma with diploma, good luck. The thing that's going to make the difference in this world is that you operate in a godly wisdom. You have a discernment. You have an intuition. God gives you something to know how to resolve, how to solve something. That makes you marketable, and that makes you now stand out. You need to seek to be strong in spirit, possessing the wisdom of God, that when I get before my job or I get before my own company, and I don't know what to do, I pray, and God all of a sudden gives me an idea. It's just boom, there it is. How do I know? I just know that I know that I know. That's how this ministry is here. I am not an educated man. I don't have 15 billion diplomas. I depend on the Holy Spirit to help me to make the right choice, the right decision. Wisdom. You can't find it in a book. I'm sorry. You can't find it. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. Let me take that back. You can. It's called the Bible. (laughs) Felt like the Holy Spirit corrected me the moment I said that. How did you do that? Wisdom. Oh, he just gave you an illustration. It went by you, so let's move on. The second thing, the second thing is the grace of God will be on you. The grace of God. The favor of God will be on you. The influence of God will be I, I just don't know why I like that person. I just don't know why I need to help this person. This person seems to possess an inward strength and a power and ability that they seem to tap into God's grace or strength in their life. How did you survive that? How did you make it through that? That tragedy in your life and you still got your smile and you still got your joy, that was the grace of God. I tapped into an unnatural strength and I tapped into an unlimited strength that came from God. The grace of God rests upon you. What does strength, what does a strong spirit look like? What does a strong spirit look like? Well, like David, it's when you are on your road to Ziglag and your city has been burnt and your wife has been stolen from you and your kids are lost and everything you own is taken from you, that all of a sudden you rise up and begin to encourage yourself in the Lord and say, God, I'm not going to give up. Can I pursue, overtake, and recover all? How can a man that lost everything... Say, I want to pursue the enemy. I want to overtake the enemy. And I want to recover everything that the enemy has stolen from me. Somebody who is strong in spirit. How can David, after losing his first child, it's dead. He lost his child. Him and Bathsheba lost their baby. How can they go home in a few days or a few 
weeks and go ahead and get impregnated again and give birth to Solomon. Because the first thing that David did after the loss of his child is he went to the house of the Lord. He went into the presence of God. He recognized a bottle, a drug, a man, a therapy, a spa treatment can't heal me. The only one that could heal me of losing my child is God because I'm strong in the spirit. It came from being strong in the Lord. So like the Shumanite woman, the Shumanite woman is going to lose her child. She's going to be sad, depressed, despondent. But here's what she's going to say about that. It is well. How are you doing today? It is well. Girl, you just lost something very dear to you. And how are you talking? It is well. She's saying it is well because I'm going to find Jesus in this. I'm going to get to the Lord. God is going to do something for me. See, I want you to recognize you are strong in the spirit and it is seen through adversity. It is not often seen through peaceful times. And so she loses her son, but she's saying it is well. And you know what? I I don't need anyone else to help me right now. The only one that can help me is God right now. And I'm not going to quit and I'm going to keep seeking him. I'm going to keep pressing in. I'm going to keep talking to God and I'm going to find God in this situation. And God does a miracle for her. Like Joshua and like Caleb. Like Joshua and Caleb against the giants and against the odds. They're going to overcome. They're strong in spirit. Here's what strong in spirit says. In spite of the giants, in spite of the odds, in spite of the reputations, in spite of the limitations, in spite of the inadequacies and the disadvantage, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Let's not, let's stop talking about how strong the devil is. Let's stop talking about our disadvantages. Let's not t- stop talking about our past. And let's rise up through the promises of God and overtake and accomplish what God told us to accomplish. How does someone do that? Wasn't raised by my daddy. Don't even know who my daddy is. All the men in my life are no good. How do you rise up against that? Let us go up in once and possess it for we're well able to overcome. I got a promise from God. I can overcome the disadvantages or the hindrances or the oppositions in my life. So Joshua and Caleb rise up above. But my last example is Paul. Paul says this in Philippians, the fourth chapter. He says, not that I speak in regard to need. Say, I don't have any need. For I've learned to be in whatever state I'm in, to be content. Today, there's a restlessness in so many Christians today. They have not learned how to be content because they're not strong in spirit. Now he's going to describe to you how he has found contentment. Watch what he says here. This is how he's found contentment. I know how to abase and I know how to abound. Two extremes. Everywhere in all things, I've learned to be full and to be hungry. Two extremes. Both uh, uh, to be hungry and to be, uh, excuse me, to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need. Two extremes. Basically, Paul's saying here, no matter what condition, no matter what's going on in my life, whether I'm full or whether I'm hungry, whether I have a pocket full of money or I don't have no money, whether my marriage is going good or my marriage is going sour, where everyone likes me or no one likes me, the next verse tells you how strong in the spirit he is. He says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Guys, this is more than a bumper sticker. This is more than something you memorize. This is more than something that's a placard in your wall. If you really really believe that you can do all things, then all things are not always fun things. All things are not always righteous things or good things or, or, or blessed things. There's sometimes sour, unexpected hardships, adversities, trials, disappointments, pain, suffering, betrayal, backslid. But I could do all things through Christ that's good or bad, in or out, up or down. Sun shining or storm, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. I can do all things through. I've learned to be content, even though circumstances, situation, and conditions are not content. They're always changing, they're always vacillating. How do you do it? Because you're strong in spirit. You're strong in spirit. That's how you could do it. But you've learned to praise God and worship God no matter what. Let me tell you this, when you're strong in spirit, you'll hold up under the pressure. 
You will be unmovable and unshakable when adversity comes your way. You will be confident and established when tough times come. You will be ready to engage the opposition when it happens. And you don't lose your joy, your peace, or the promise of God, even though you feel like everything is being stolen out from under you. Let me ask you a question. Let's just say getting ready in the morning. How long does it take you to get ready? How many of you know some people it takes a long time? And we appreciate that it took you so long because we love beauty. But, but let's go a little thing, you know. If, if you looked at somebody, I said, you know what? How long does it take you to get ready to lose weight? Because you've been saying five years now you're going to lose weight. <laughs> and you said, you know what? Uh, how long does it take you to get ready? You've been saying you're going to let go of that boy or girl for a long time because they're stringing you on and they're depleting you of all your money and they don't have a job and they're saying, I'm going to marry you someday. How long does it take you to get ready to pull the trigger on that? And you've been talking about getting your money in order. How long does it take you to get ready? See, how long it takes you to get ready is often a sign of how strong you are. And when the enemy engages you, how long will it take you to get ready to engage him back? See, you need to be ready because I'm already full of the word. I'm already full of the presence of God. I'm already full of prayer. I am already ready to engage. I don't need to go away to boot camp. I don't need to go on a, you know, a, a time to, to, to learn warfare. I'm ready. I'm ready. I don't want to. Not welcome, but shh, I'm ready. I stay ready. That's what a strong person, they stay ready. So if you said, go run up that mountain, let's go run. I don't need three months. Let's go. Now, you're not ready, but I'm ready because I stay ready. So when my grandkids say, Dad, Grandpa, let's go on a five-mile run, I'll say yes. Why? Because that's why I work out today because I'm going to be ready one day. Why do I pray every day for my wife and say that I love her unconditionally? Because there's going to come a day when I don't feel in love with her. But I'm ready. Because I'm full. Okay, let's move on because that's a little too deep for you. <laughs> how long does it take you to recover? Shows how strong you are. So let's just say you, you haven't been to the gym in, in a year and you go to the gym and you work out for three months. I mean, you work out for three hours. Yes. When are we going to see you in the gym again? <laughs> how long are you going to be sore? See, how long you're sore tells me how good shape you're in. Because everybody's going to get sore when they stretch them. Everybody gets sore. But how long does it take to recover tells me how strong you are. Okay, someone, someone cussed you out. Your, mar your marriage, your, your wife said something to you. Okay, you got fired. Okay, you got disappointed. Your prayers weren't answered. How, how long do we have to wait for you to recover? How long are we going to wait before you come back to church, pray, tithe again, and serve? How long? How long are we going to... You're not as strong as you think. You're strong outside. You're strong here, but you're not strong in spirit. It takes you forever to recover. See, one of the reasons why I eat, now I don't care how you eat. I'm talking about me. The one of the reasons why I eat the way I eat is I love how my body recovers. I'm, I'm just very grateful. I'm just very grateful. I'm grateful that I don't have to, you know, I, I don't know what it is to have a pneumonia. I don't know what it is to have the flu. I don't know what it is to have a cough for three weeks or to be sick for a month in bed. My body recovers very, very quickly. And it's not because I have a natural great immune system. It's because I have a great diet, which leads me to the third point, and I'm done. I'm, I'm almost ashamed to tell you how to have a strong spirit, because you already know the answer, but here we go. How do you have a strong spirit? It's your feeding program, it's your exercise program, and it's your rest program. How, how do you have a strong body? It's your feeding program. It, it, it's your exercise program. It's your rest program. How do, how do I have a great marriage? It's your feeding program. It, it applies to everything. So if you are not strong in spirit, I need to ask you, what does your appetite consist of? What does your diet consist of? What are you feeding on all the time? You don't love your wife, so let's check on what you've been feeding on. What you've been watching, what you've been listening to, who you've been talking to at work, who you've been hanging on. No wonder you don't have an appetite for your wife. 
So it's your feeding program. You know, there's all kinds of natural diets, Atkins diet, keto diet, Weight Watchers diet, South Beach diet, uh, vegan diet, paleo diet, seafood diet. Pomona, they didn't get that, but I'm hoping you got it because rancho people are a little slow. So see seafood. I'm not talking about lobster and shellfish. It's really all about your feeding program. How long can you go without praying? How long can you go without cracking that Bible? How long can you go without worshiping God? How long can you go without fasting? That tells me your feeding program. Tells me how strong you are right there. If you can go days, then that tells me you're not strong in spirit. I, I have to pray every day. I have to read the Bible every day. I have to periodically go on fasts. If I'm going to remain strong in the spirit across the board for you, for my family, for my grandchildren, I, and, and always be ready to engage, I have to have a great feeding program. I have to have a great feeding program. The second word is exercise program. Bodily exercise profited little, but godliness is profitable to all. Exercise is mobility. You got to move. You got to move. You got to move, right? Why are, why, why, what happens if you don't exercise? You get flabby. You get lazy. And there's a lot of flabby, lazy Christians because they don't exercise. They don't do nothing. They don't do nothing. You're not giving of your gifts. You're not giving of your talents. You don't serve anywhere. You're, the attendance isn't as consistent as it needs to be. You don't obey God and do what he tells you to do. When adversity comes, you don't rise up in your spiritual authority. That's exercise. And exercise your right as an heir of God over the enemy and what he's trying to deceive you with and lie to you. You don't exercise your thoughts by casting them down. So it's your exercise program. You're just taking, you're just taking, you're just taking. You're not using your authority. And you're not giving and you're not serving. So you become flabby. And you come lazy. So it's your exercise program. And last of all, it's your rest program. Rest in the Lord, the Bible says. You got to rest. See, if I fed right and I exercise right, then my rest is going to be sweet. Okay? See, but if I'm not feeding right and I'm not exercising right, then I can't sleep at night. I got insomnia. I'm tossing and turning. I'm looking at the ceiling at one o'clock in the morning. That's not a healthy, normal lifestyle. What happens when you have good sleep? What's the purpose of sleep? It rejuvenates and it repairs. That's what you have to do. That's why you need to sleep in a dark room. You need to, you need to throw this outside or wherever, far, as far away from you as you can because you can't sleep with this. Ding, 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 ding. Go to bed. Rest, rest. See, a sign that you are resting in the Lord, you have no worry, you have no fear, and you have no complaint. I could tell if you're rested or not. How many have ever seen somebody who, who sleeps really good? Don't look at your mate, he sleeps really hard. They're a hard sleeper. How many know when you sleep really hard, a train can go right through the middle of the room? They won't budge. They won't budge, they sleep hard. Okay, uh, how many of you have ever done this? I do this often. You sleep so hard when you wake up, you forget what day it is, who you are, where you're at for a minute. <laughs> have you ever done like? <laughs> that's the kind of rest God wants to give you today. But you're resting in His promises. You're trusting Him. You're relying on Him. But you can't rest if you've not fed right and you've not disciplined yourself right. So Pomona, as I get ready to close out this message in Rancho and soon to be Arrowhead, let me read you a story of a man named John Wesley and the strength that he possessed. John Wesley was born in England and then came to America. He may be foreign to you or you may know who he is, but he was the author and the originator of the Methodist movement. He truly was a man of God. He averaged in his lifetime 15, 15 sermons a day. He preached over 40,000 sermons in his lifetime. He traveled on horseback over 250,000 miles to preach the gospel all over America. 
He had a journal, and here's some of the stats that were in his journal. This was registered uh, when he was eight, until he was 88 years old, he wrote in his journal. At 69, is there anyone 69 years old in here? Okay, watch this. Here's what his journal said. My voice and my strength are the same as it was when I was 29 years old. God has wrought this for me. Anybody 73 years old? At 73 years old, it said, I am far abler to preach than I was when I was 23 years old, 78 years old. I am just the same as when I entered my 28th year. This God has wrought for me, chiefly by constant exercise, rising up early and preaching morning and until evening. At 82... Two years old, I find myself just as strong to labor and as fit in any exercise of bodily or mind as I was 40 years ago. It's a sovereign God. Then at 85 years old, watch this. Wesley, anybody 85? This is what Wesley says. Wesley acknowledged that his voice is not as strong as it has been in the past and expresses concern. That not everyone in the crowd of 25,000 people had been able to hear him in his sermon clearly, remembering he was preaching without any sound equipment or microphone back then. And acknowledges some challenges at 85 years old with his eyesight and writes, because I am losing a little bit of strength, I must guard myself to only preach twice a day now. And some of you are half his age and already retired, giving up on God and not doing nothing. Some of you are near that age and think that time is over for you. How is someone able to do that? Because they're drawing on the... I can't do nothing about my outward exterior. It's going to get aged. It's going to grow. But my inward man is renewed day by day. And I'm stronger on the inside than I would ever be on the outside. Father, I thank you for the message today, and I pray that it resonates in our hearts today. Thank you for a clear, very, very clear message of how important it is to be strong in the Spirit, God. Father, I thank you. We want to walk in that wisdom, and we want to walk in that grace. So I, today, Lord, I thank you that for all of us, we're going to walk away with, uh, from this message saying we need to become strong, and we need to continue to be strong, because we don't know what tomorrow holds. And I don't know what I'm going to hear, and I don't know what I'm going to go through. But the only way I'm going to make it is to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. In Jesus' name, amen.